everyone, and welcome to Candidate Conversations. My name is Ellen Dennis, and I'm the state government reporter at the Spokesman Review newspaper. We're here in Spokane, Washington today. Next to me is Jonathan Brunt, the local government editor at the Spokesman Review, and we're joined by Jamie Herrera Butler, a Republican candidate for Commissioner of Public Lands in Washington State. Jamie, thanks so much for being here with us today. You're welcome. It's good to be here. To begin with, why don't you give us your pitch? Why, why are you running for this office, and why should people vote for yeah, you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my husband Dan and I are raising our three kiddos in what is the path of the Yakult Burn, which stood for over 100 years as the largest forest fire in Washington state history. Uh, but in just this past decade, that horrible record has been surpassed three times. Um, so too many of our forests are undermanaged or neglected, and they have turned into crowded, diseased tinder boxes and they're just waiting for a spark and you know I, I seeing smoke <laughs> during our summers having it ruin our days and it doesn't matter if you're in eastern Washington central Washington southwest or up in the north northwest part of the state the smoke impacts us all it impacts our our life our mental health our health and the in and <laughs> importantly our ecosystems and so I would like to pass on to my kids and hopefully my future grandkids the Washington that I grew up with, which is healthy um, and well-managed and open to all Washingtonians. So when I looked at this race and was asked to consider running, I reflected on the time I've gotten to spend in Congress working on, so, so Southwest Washington is one of the most heavily forested areas in the country. Most people don't know that. So my first bill had to do with protecting forest roads and forest uh, jobs. So I got to know a lot about forestry, fish, wild salmon, and habitat restoration work. And so when I looked at this, I thought, you know what? I want to pass on my kids what I got. And so I'm going to run and see if I can't do something about the state of our, our forests and our, our managed lands. You know, uh, you bring up the smoke issue, which mm -hmm. has become a it's a season. Almost, yeah, a season, it's a right? Season. Uh, and hasn't been too bad in Spokane this year, but most Not years now. Yeah. Um, do you think climate change is playing a role in forest fires? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, if anyone believes that it is, we should be using marshalling all of our innovation and ingenuity here in the 21st century with technology to do everything we can to mitigate it. We should help our forests adapt and become more resilient. Healthy forests are the ones that manage or make their way through. They can they can survive fi fires. What they can't survive, though, is disease and and you know dead trees all over the forest floor, and then add on top of that, you know, warmer climates, right? So we have to do the work to help them, not just survive but thrive. We are gonna have to adapt, and what we know is we can we can help our forests be resilient and healthy. Um, and do that. So to me, this, you know, whether it doesn't <laughs> believe in it or don't believe in it or who caused it, d none of that matters to me. The facts are to me that it's changing. So let's equip um, our, our, you know, our, our, our forests, our ag land, our grazing land to do as well as they can throughout that change. Are there things you could do as a lands commissioner or want to do as lands mm -hmm. commissioner to prevent more climate change. Yes, absolutely. And so what, what, yes. what kind of things would those be? So most folks, you know, don't know all of the science behind what me, what what we can do immediately, right? Everybody, they talk about, let's sign this pact, and in 30 years, we're going to reduce our whatever. Well, the facts in Washington State are every year, <laughs> almost every year, you know, um, COVID changed things, but still grew. We have grown, our climate emissions, our CO2 emissions in Washington have grown, certainly for the last several years, right? We have this amazing resource. Trees store carbon, but it's not all trees, healthy trees, trees of a certain age, they store it. And so if you have a, a forest stand that has healthy trees in it, it's going to work like a carbon sink. Conversely, if you have old dead and dying trees, they release it. They're like people. You're right, they live and they die, and so if you and if you look, there's been a lot of research on the West Coast where we've had these fires out of major universities that show that the older, uh, more dilapidated forests are the ones that release the carbon. In addition, and and I'll get into this because I I am a big believer in protecting old growth, so we'll just do a little bit of the science around this first. Um, 
in addition, if you go into the you know medium size, mature but not young, not old forests, right, and you thin in certain areas, you remove the trees that have died and are just laying there, right? You remove some of the hazardous ha hazardous fuels reduction. Those forests store the most carbon, and they also can survive fires. So what you're doing is you're creating a space, and when you remove some of the trees sustainably, you can capture the carbon that's in that tree and use it for, I'm looking at a wooden door, we're using a wooden table. You know, it can frame houses here, right? It's, in my mind, the question is, how do we want to use our sustainably harvest timber? Or, so Washington State imports about 40% of its timber from places where they don't have strong environmental protections, from places where they don't do sustainable forestry, from Russia. <laughs> we're, we're, we're importing enough wood to, to frame homes in all the, you know, the housing needs that we have, about 450,000 houses. But we're importing that, and we're exporting, I would say, a negative um, impact on the environment. So coupled with really stringent environmental protections, which we have in Washington, standards, we, we lead the nation. If we utilize those standards and we do that forestry work to clean up and make our forests healthy, it's just such a win. We reduce carbon emissions. We make sure that they can sustain through these catastrophic fires. And actually, we're going to reduce the catastrophic fires. They're going to look more natural. Right? It's not going to be this earth scorching, you know, destroy. And we're going to end up, the other thing you do when you do that sustainable harvest is you're going to have to, so it's three trees about for every tree that you're pulling out. So you can also introduce trees or species that are similar, <laughs> not different, we're not talking about trees from a different region, but that maybe it could withstand or a little bit more climate resilient, right? That that probably can withstand some more temperature changes, right? So there's all these different things that the scientists at DNR and around the universities on the West Coast are, are encouraging us to do. But the biggest problem I think we have is we have our minds so wrapped around, there's only one way to protect the forest, and that's to close it off, hug that tree, and then walk away. And that's very old science. That's 40 plus years old. And so my big hope with this is, um, to open the door to people who maybe don't always support Republicans, right? Like, I'm right there with you. I want to pass this on. But we have to use, you know, 21st century technology and science to guide us. And as the researchers and the biologists show us what to do, we have to be willing to say no to political parties and political pressure and, and special interests on all sides and follow this path. But if we do that, we can reduce our carbon emissions. We know... For every acre of managed TNR land, like healthy trees, where you've gotten rid of some of the older stuff or the dead stuff, you know, stuff that has been has passed all the environmental muster, we know that it, it sequesters about 11.7 metric tons of carbon. So it's it, the facts are there, and we can reduce our emissions. But there's such a battle in our state over what I would call old science with regard to how we manage. So as you know, forests look a lot different on either sides of mm -hmm. the Cascades. Ponderosa forests over here tip in eastern Washington are typically further apart, mm -hmm. and dug fir forests are closer together. Could you talk about the difference in what a healthy forest looks like on either side of the Cascades and what your role would be in mm -hmm. addressing that at DNR? Well, so there's a couple. So there, there are different regions, obviously, and there are different foresters and scientists in those regions, and they are dedicated to that region and the science behind what the ecology needs and what it supports. Um, you know, wet side forests and dry side forests are pretty different. You got pine, you got dug fir, you have different, you know, different species. Interesting fact, the dug fir stands, most, a large majority of the dug fir stands on the wet side of Washington were planted. They're second and third plantations, right? They're not original. Um, species, but we figured out, you know, in the 20s, 1900s and 20s, like if you, they, they'll grow fast, they'll do well here. So they planted large stands of these dug firs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What we now know, so typically you all deal with the fires more, the wildland fires here more severely, right? You, just to what you said, you have the dry side forests. Um, and so there has been a lot more focus and attention on the 20 year forest plan and how to bring. Um, Eastern Washington, Central Washington forests into health. Um, there was actually the c current commissioner, I give her a lot of props for this. She really focused firefighting resources, which was the first big immediate triage, like we can't, we got to stop the fires. But then the up, upside work or up, up river work is making sure that the stands are healthy and that the forest, the, the hazardous fuels are reduced. It also, it's not just forests here, what she manages, you're, you're managing, um, about a million acres of ag lands. 
um, the largest wheat grower in the state. All the wheat growers, like it, it, technically, DNR, the wheat comes off of about 50% of it comes off of DNR land. So leases use DNR land. So there's a lot more than just the, the, the pine forests and the cleanup work that has to be done on those. It's also managing the dry land and the agricultural grazing. And all those together, if they are well sustained and not left to grow with invasive species and overgrow, um, combine can help reduce the impacts of the fires. There will always be fires, but th what we're seeing is, in, in the, for the federal government is the, I, I would argue, the worst at this. If you walk onto a federal forest land versus a state forest land versus private forest land, you'll see the succession of poorly managed, better managed, best managed. Um, and I think that part of what needs to happen over here is the relationship between the federal government on the different forests, Okanagan, where they haven't even done salvage work. So there's a lot of dead and dying trees. I was just in Chelan and we were talking about um, the fires that endangered Stahican. Well, they, they started on, on private land, but very quickly moved on to federal land. And then the Fed said, well, we're going to let it you know, we're not going to aggressively do this. And it burned for months. It's still burning. And so I think that the partnership between the federal and the state um, commissioner needs to improve with regard to immediate the cleanup work through good neighbor authority and then the, um, the fighting kind of jurisdiction, you know, when it happens, who does what when. I'm a big believer in put it out as quickly as you can. Um, the other thing that I think is important to note, so we talk a lot about the fires and that happen over here and it's drier. For the first time in recorded history, we had more fires on Western, in Western Washington. So on our wet side forests. So it's not like we can just um, pretend like this is a static environment and we'll just try and stop it all where it is right now. It's gonna de further deteriorate if we don't change our management structure. Um, and that's a lot of work I'm learning. That It's not that there aren't people who know what to do and how to do it. What I've seen from this position is the political pressure that comes out of really extremist groups, particularly in one, one part of the state. And um, I think their heart's in the right place. They want to see things preserved. But oftentimes, they apply very old science to the forests around them, whether it's in eastern Washington or western, right? They all have second homes somewhere. And my hope is to bridge some of that gap, to get them to the table, um, to get tribes to the table, which I've worked with before and con will continue to work with here. They've managed our lands <laughs> since before we were here. <laughs> um, and, and develop a plan for the western side that shows the same kind of progress we've seen in the eastern side. It seems like I, I, I <clears throat> you have a lot of plans to improve things in lots of different ways. Will that take a higher budget and more? I love this question. And more employees and not necessarily. Okay. Um, so there. So the one thing people don't understand. Okay, let me, this role, Commissioner of Public Lands, is an executive. It's not a legislative position, right? It manages about two thousand employees in these different regions across the state. Um, the trust side. So there's two pieces. It has a regulatory authority over private sector timberlands. So all the strict environmental regulations that Washington has, this commissioner is charged with making sure it, it's, it's acted on on private lands. On state trust lands, it has a fiduciary responsibility. It's, there are different lands that were given at statehood by the federal government and then from counties as the program evolved to as a sustaining revenue source. You manage, you, you harvest pieces of it over time in succession and that will in perpetuity provide money for schools primarily this was whole the whole thing was set up to provide money for public schools for construction it's evolved there you know police fire hospital it, but essentially public services so if i would like to bring the trust side back into sustaining revenue it used to sustain itself but over time as we reduced about half of those trust lands we have set aside we will not harvest right for for environmental reasons it's critical habitat it so over 50 percent of the trust land that was supposed to be being harvested in perpetuity is set aside off limits and this is where i think we have a real opportunity. So of the 49% or so that we can still harvest in different patches all over the state, if you do that in succession planning and in a sustainable way, 
you can you can pay for it. You can then keep that money back into the forest to do the civil culture work and the fuels reduction work, and then you can send part, and then the way, it, you know, it's a formula, right? Then the rest of it goes to the county or to the local school. So, you know, I would really love to bring us back to a place where we're not going hat in hand to Olympia every year saying, can I have more money to do the basic work of this office, which is sustainably manage the public's land? You can do it, but it hasn't, I mean, there really has been a pressure on this position to stop harvesting any land. So the gentleman, I don't know if you've talked to him, I'm sure you will if you haven't, um, that I'm running against, um, his plan on day one is to set aside another 77,000 acres of that 49%. So of the harvestable land, he wants to pull out almost 80,000 acres. That's just a day one like opening salvo. This is how he wants to do it. I know his heart's in the right place. I think he's a decent guy. But my view on that is that we are, that's doubling down on the failed policy that we've had that has gotten us to this point. I don't want to see those lands go into decay and degradation. I want to harvest some of that in different pieces, right, sustainably, keep that money going into the work that keeps it healthy and funds our schools. I want those forests to survive the fires. I want them to continue to provide habitat for fish. Um, for salmon and endangered species. I want them to continue. So, it, 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 I mean, that's the big battle. Folks who he is, who pays a lot of attention to, have said, set aside more land, set aside more land. And I'll tell you, we have, there's at least three timber sales that are paused or canceled that he's advocated for. And I'll tell you, so one of them is the Mount Banker School District in Whatcom County. And I just read the letter from the school district um, board members to the Board of Natural Resources, basically begging them, they're a very timber impacted county, to continue the sales of the harvestable land. He said, we've already cut 23 teachers. We have had, we've massively increased like uh, school class sizes. We have, it, these children are already being significantly impacted because we, we used to get about 1.2 million a year out of the revolving harvest fund. They're to 100 and just over $100,000 this year. They are operating completely in the red, and they're under basically this this jurisdictional kind of budget lockdown from OSPI because they're not meeting their budget. And his, he's basically begging the board, saying, "This is what this is for. If you don't cut this, these kids are not going to get the same basic, you know, free and fair public education that they're entitled to." That's Whatcom County. It's happened in Clallam County, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Thurston County has three different public sales that were that have gone through all the environmental work. You know, about three feet of NEPA, SEPA, and full ecological review, and they've been cleared for sale. And those are on hold or paused. That's about $7 million to the schools in, in Thurston County, right? Olympia School District. Incl there's more that goes to the police and the fire. So, you know, my opponent keeps talking about how that's, he's proud of that. He's been a part of the activism that has done that. And that's what he wants to apply to what's left of the trust lands. And this is what, this is, this, I think this important, this is such an important election for the future of those lands. I believe if we're going to pass them on, we have to, we have to do the work that protects them and makes them sustainable. The 51% that mm -hmm. is unharvestable, mm -hmm. are you committed mm -hmm. to not harvesting yeah. this? Yes, I'm going to abide by that. I'm, I'm also, you know, very clear. I'm not, I'm going to abide by, we have the most stringent forest and fish rules in the nation, our habitat conservation plans. We lead the nation in how we do our, the, the level of, of pristine work we do with regard to our timber harvest. And, and if it doesn't meet that muster, those stands don't get put in a, like they're not in a harvestable, they don't get the sign off. It's the FSC standard, which interestingly, the, Sierra Club calls the gold standard for forestry. That is the standard to which we comb through every single stand when we're considering it on the trust land. And so if it's past those musters, I mean, this is, <laughs> these aren't, these are not, um, you know, these are biologists and foresters who got into this to, because they believe in it. They're not trying to, you know, leave our, our landscape devastated. And I will, I will not just maintain those, but I will continue to hold those up as a model for the nation I'm not trying to undo that work. I'm trying to make sure that what is still on the table to be done, that the, the cleanup work gets done. Healthy forests can live through fires, but our forests are not healthy, and that needs to change. Um, it seems like every other year, 
over here in Washington State, a different town burns down. A little mm -hmm. over a year ago, we saw Medical Lake devastated by the Gray and Oregon Road fires. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that damage is preventable. What can the DNR do to um, save those homes and those lives? I, I 100% believe the DNR has a role. Now, I'm not saying DNR is going to stop every fire. <laughs> That's impossible. But we can change the devastation and the damage levels, right? And we can make sure things are more fire resilient. Um, you know, I was at the 10 year anniversary of the Carlton Complex fire, and, you know, I sat with these families who 10 years later um, are still trying to get their homes rebuilt. Um, and they're very frustrated because there were specific decisions made by the state and the federal um, land managers either not to do the cleanup work before or not to fight it aggressively when it happened. Um, again, I think our current commissioner has done, she's a Democrat, and I give her a lot of props for this. She's done the yeoman's work on the Eastern Washington um, strategic plan to combat the fires. She has, I want to say there's about, she's done about, I think it's 1.25 1, 1 million acres that have been identified here that need to be cleaned up in order to be more fire resilient. She's gotten about half of that done. She had 20 years to get it done. She's done half of it in seven years. So we know that it works. Um, it's gonna take time to see those impacts, right? Like the work is just being completed and those make things more fire resilient. It keeps um, the, the hazardous fuels down and it keeps the forest more healthy. That's gonna take more work for us to see the impact. But if we didn't do it, <laughs> we'd be in a worse place. You know, I was down in Chelan and I, um, have talked to residents about this Tahe the fire that caused Tahikin to evacuate. I mean, that's still burning. I just think, I think we need to be willing to push on some of the old standing notions that say, well, the best thing to do is to walk away. Don't do the salvage on the Okanagan. Don't, you know, there are tribes over here who do pretty great work managing their own timber stands. And what they've said to me is we're worried about the state lands and the public land, uh, the federal lands, public lands, where they don't, you guys don't do the cleanup work because the fire is going to start there and it doesn't know a political boundary. It's going to come right through and cost us and our, you know, our community members livelihoods. And I think we have to come back to the fact that this office, this commissioner has a fiduciary responsibility, number one, to produce for the public schools and, and local um, services. But in doing that work, you're also doing very important environmental work that brings us into the 21st century with regard to climate change and sustainable forestry. And it's time we do that in Washington State. I, I grew up down in Southwest Washington and the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, you know, fishing, hunting, you know, river floating, all that we had, you know, the, on the Columbia River or in, in the Lewis River. And I remember the spotted owl wars. I remember all the groups that came in and, you know, if you love the forest, you're going to stop. And I actually agree that they were commercially completely destroying the, the federal forest. Like, that was unsustainable. 70s, 80s, like, that's, you couldn't do that. So they used the signs that they had at the time to create a plan, which was essentially to lock away major, major swaths of the forest. Um, well, what we know today is that the owl, which was the species they had decided to protect, has still declined every year, about 3% per year, it's still in danger of extinction. And our forests now are just ripe for another Yakult burn. They are ripe because they, we haven't even been able to salvage the trees. Um, more die and fall than we are able to get off of there. And they're in worse shape. They're emitting more carbon. We now have better science. Time to update it again. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. And then it's just... Just how very, long and deep. I, it's <laughs> not going to be very long and deep. Do you have a favorite tree? And mm. if so, why? What I do. I have yeah. a... Um, I actually really like the pine trees. I love like the red. I, I have I have one in our on my property with a lot of dug fur and they're great and I love dug fur. But there's something just mag I think magnificent about the pine needles and they come out of the follicles and that's how you can tell which one it is, how many follicles does it have, and the bark is beautiful and I have a couple hummingbirds, actually dozens. And they all fight to be in the pine tree in different branches. And it's just my favorite one. So I look, when I come over to this side of the state and I get to see the dry side forest, and you see the pine cones all over the ground. Anymore, I'm always worried about fire. <laughs> it's what's always top of mind. But up against a river or a lake, 
and you see those and you think, gosh, we live in the most beautiful state in the nation. Like, this is amazing. All right. Well, I thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. And uh, uh, vote on November 5th. Yes. Oh, or your before, vote counts. Yeah. Vote, your vote counts. Vote before November 5th. Yeah, please. All right. All right. <laughs> vote early. All right. Thank you. <laughs>